Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and I'd like to talk about becoming a highly valued resource in the training and development, learning and development, learning experience design function, uh, especially during these times of uh, COVID-19, the uh, global pandemic that we're all facing. It's not an option to become a highly valued resource. It's an imperative. Uh, I'm going to bet that your function produces lots and lots of content. Most organizations that are in the uh, training business or instruction business, uh, that's what they do. Uh, hopefully it's uh, truly instructional, and by the word instruction I mean job aids and or training, uh, standalone job aids, job aids embedded in training, and training when you're really reserving that uh, mode of uh, delivery for things that need to be memorized by people uh, because they it's required on demand in their performance context in the workflow. Um, or you, they need specially uh, honed skills such as uh, answering customer objections or treating a medical emergency or whatever. It's just that the performance context demands an immediate response and people have to have certain things memorized and certain skills at the ready. Um, so it needs to be instructional. Um, it needs to be uh, authentic performance. It needs to reflect authentic performance requirements back on the job. Uh, instruction that doesn't uh, really get to that authentic um, experience is usually a wasted investment. Um, it needs to, the instruction needs to reflect and address the authentic performance tasks leading to the authentic outputs uh, that are required back on the job. And it's as simple as that. And hopefully, and this is, I think, a, the main issue, major issue, is that it needs to deal with high stakes performance only. Um, we shouldn't be addressing low stakes performance where the return on any investment is nil or negative or medium uh, stakes performance because there's probably enough high stakes performance that you really need to be addressing. And so I think there's two, there's two critical uh, things that you need to address in order to help your organization, your learning and development, your training and development, your instructional systems design function or your learning experience design function become a highly valued resource. And those two things involve a governance and advisory system and the product and service line development system. Now, the first system, uh, and I addressed both of these in my 2001 book, Training and Development Systems View, where I took 47 processes and organized them into 12 subsystems of a system, the Training and Development System or Learning and Development or whatever you want to call it. Um, the governance and advisory system uh, is composed of basically two major processes. One of those is an advisory process or system, because it could be multiple processes, and I consider a system to be a bundle of processes. But uh, there's advice that percolates up through the organization, through the enterprise, and gets to a governance board. And then the governance board takes a look at all of the potential investments to be made in learning or training or instruction and decides what they're going to address. And of course, the people at the top of the organization, the enterprise leaders, are going to want to focus on what they perceive to be the critical business issues that are of strategic importance or operational importance. So they're either looking out towards the future and deciding what do we need to start working on now to be ready for that future, short term, medium term, and long term, or what are the current day operational issues that uh, where we perceive that there's uh, uh, room for improvement, a need for improvement, um, and we need to make certain investments in that. And that could include capital investments and then investments in people. Um, so in this video here, I'd like to address uh, those two systems, the governance and advisory system and the product and service line development system. So training products and services. Coaching could be considered a service and you need to kind of set that up more formally than informally. Um, if you're dealing with high stakes performance, if it's medium stakes and low stakes, then you would let it leave it to informal learning or informal coaching. 
um, and you wouldn't put the effort behind it because the stakes don't warrant that. Um, so this governance and advisory system is, I think, critically important. Uh, learning and development, training and development is a service organization. It serves the organization, it serves the enterprise, it doesn't lead the enterprise as much as you might see that uh, in various social media where, you know, learning and development needs to take the lead on this and lead on that. And I, I totally disagree. It really needs to take the lead on uh, the learning sciences and reflecting the learning sciences in the products and services it renders to its internal marketplace, unless it's dealing with suppliers and customers as well. But that's the job. It's, its job is to enable performance and to figure out what are the performance requirements and how do we enable that and what can learning, training, instruction do and what can't it do? Because you might uncover in your analysis efforts the, some of the issues, some of the barriers to performance that training is not going to be able to train away, solve. Um, and so the governance and advisory system allows the organization to, again, percolate up the requirements based on management's perceptions of what's required to be addressed. And of course, that doesn't make them right just because they all come to some sort of consensus on you know what things should uh, training or instruction address. Um, but that goes up and then business decisions are made at the top in terms of where that those investments are gonna be made. Now, when I worked at Motorola back in 1981 and 82, um, my future business partner, Ray Svensson, had helped Bill Wiggenhorn install a governance and advisory system where the uh, organization was, there were five business sectors and each one of those business sectors had two um, uh, potential people, the top two people in each business sector sat on this board of governors and they decided you know, what, where the money was gonna be spent, whatever budget they were given. And if they weren't given enough, they went to the organization and pried loose additional resources to meet the demands, the requirements of the business. And at the in within the business sectors, there were different organizational entities, and they all uh, came together in advisory councils, discussed their needs, found what was common across uh, a majority of the five business sectors, so three out of five, and would decide what requests that they would then put to the uh, Board of Governors. And uh, in Motorola's example, they had a advisory council on sales and marketing. They had one on manufacturing materials uh, and purchasing. They had another one on um, engineering. It was an engineering driven firm. And then there was one on management. And they may have uh, added others after I left. I was only there for 18 months. But so that's how the organization placed its demands it was the kind of the intake process, if you will, because when the word came down from the Board of Governors as to what we were to work on, that's what we worked on. We were working at their behest. We were working on their critical business issues as they saw them. And although there were times when some of those bis critical business issues became less critical or something displaced it, we would shift resources and begin to work on their top priorities. We were less likely to, to be affected by huge up sizing and downsizing requirements. Upsizing as the demand grew, but that would have required them to pony up more money in the budget. And that didn't happen too often. It did happen the very first time. I remember uh, requests had been made by the engineering organizations and the governance boards gave the engineering organizations uh, functions uh, a certain amount of money and the engineering uh, advisory uh, council pushed back and said that was totally inadequate to their needs and they ended up getting triple what they originally asked for, millions of dollars. Um, and we back at uh, what was then uh, our forerunners to Motorola University at uh, the Motorola's Training and Education Center, MTEC, we, uh, the, the ISDers, if you will, in that organization were thrilled that our clients were demanding more resources for instructional products and services. And that's what we then would work on. And I think that that's a huge win. So, um, the, so once you have the governance and advisory system in place, you're gonna know what the key top priorities, you're gonna be in alignment with leadership in terms of working on the right kinds of things, not low hanging fruit, not medium hanging fruit, high stakes performance. 
they deemed it necessary. They deemed it important enough to resource it. And so that's what we worked on. In the, uh, but so you have to put that in place. You have to have something like that. More formal than not, I think, for most organizations, but sometimes it could be informal. It, as always, it depends. So if you put a system in place there where you are truly aligned with the leadership and working at their behest on their critical needs, um, you would become, you'd have the potential to become a highly valued resource to the enterprise. But then you got to pull it off. So you have to have in place your, the equivalent of an Addy like or SAM or uh, SAT, which is a structured approach to training. There's many different models for new product development for instruction, job aids and training. But you have to have that in place to be successful. You have to really, you know, if you're going to be working on high stakes performance, you better do a stellar job at it. and You better have a high stakes impact to the performance of the people that you were addressing as targeted by the governance and advisory system. So uh, when you, you, you might have to have like a program management approach to kinds of things where you have, <laughs> excuse me, a bundle of projects, instructional design projects that need to be worked on. And so you might have to have some sort of a program management level on this, depending on the size of your organization and the size of the workload that you're expecting the training and development, the learning and development function to attend to. Um, then you do custom development of content that didn't exist before. You have to have another process that goes out and searches for uh, externally or internally content that already exists that you can buy or maybe you, your shareholders have already paid for it. And so you're going to then reuse it. You're either going to reuse it as is or after some level of modification. And that's where you get into legal issues with who owns the content. And what can you really do to modify it? Maybe you can't. Maybe all you can do is bolt on something on the front end and then something on the back end and use some generic active listening course, but you've set it up and, and talked about what the true applications for act, uh, active listening are for targeted audiences, not general audiences. Um, and then, you, then people take the active listening and then you put on exercises, uh, practice with feedback that's authentic to the target audience's actual performance. You don't teach them on generic content and expect that that's going to transfer, not when you're dealing with high stakes performance. Um, so there's a purchase product kind of a acquisition and, and, and uh, development effort that goes on. Um, one of the things that we always have to keep in mind as an instructional design shop is maintenance of our content. If our content is truly targeted at high stakes performance, then we don't want to be the organization that the cause for performance degradating. We want to make sure that our instruction for new hires or our instruction when things change and we need to have a change management process and keep our content evergreen. So that's the last of the processes as I see them uh, within the system, subsystem as I call it, for uh, product and service line development. Um, I hope this has been helpful in, in me conveying what I think the two necessary systems, bundles of processes, that are necessary for your organization to become a highly valued resource. Now, there's 47 processes in my model, T&D systems view, uh, within 12 subsystems, and we've talked about two of them, but I think that these are the most critical. If I was taking over a training and development function, a learning and development function, that's where I would focus on first, to make sure that I'm truly aligned and working on the critical business needs and that only, and that I have a set of methodologies, a set of processes and tools and techniques in place to build authentic performance-based instruction that'll truly have an impact back on the job. This is Guy Wallace. Thanks for listening.